Uh, hello, I'm Kirk Freeman, teaching the art department here at Bethel University. Um, my area is ceramic, so everything having to do with clay. I started um, in a smaller college, taught there for eight years, and so uh, it was a three-person department. We had to teach across, across lines of our expertise into areas of our non-expertise. So I taught things like you know, two-dimensional design, three-dimensional design, little art history, advanced painting, advanced drawing. It was a, you know, and some of those areas I had experience in, others I didn't. And so I think from that I learned how to tap other people's resources. Um, there's a lot of experience that I kind of gained from other, from other sources, other uh, people that, that were very strong in their fields. And I, th and I also think I learned how to craft courses decently. Um, um, that after leaving there, I have had a couple stints where I was just a studio potter. So probably professionally that was important, um, and, and you know, be able to bring that into my teaching. Um, and then at Bethel, it's been all clay all the time, so it's been it's been very nice in that way. So I can focus on on the things that I feel that are important to me and that I can bring to the students. My style um, is relatively informal, I think, if there's a word for it. And I think because it's a studio course, it's a little different animal than most courses taught here at Bethel. It, it, they tend to be a little more informal. There's a lot more time spent with students individually. Um, my courses are relatively structured, but I try to um, create them so they don't seem to be. Um, there seems to be some fluidity to it, but in fact I'm layering um, the ideas and the, and the processes that, that these students need to, need to learn. But I don't know, I've just been kind of comfortable with making the course a, a comfortable situation for students to come into. You know, it's funny because over the years I've, I've done a little bit more and more of that. And I don't know if, if my if, uh, use of humor is sort of a dog and pony show that keeps the students interested um, or if it's something that keeps me interested. <laughs> but I, it does feel like it's something that, that I can bring to a course in, of this nature that seems to help a little bit. And, and it may break down some barriers, may feel, make students, I think, feel a little bit more comfortable with me. And so I what I do. <laughs> Probably my expertise is, is the first one. I mean, I, I've been doing this for a long time and I, and I do it both professionally as a, as a working potter, but, you know, a, a teacher as well. Um, but I think I, I, I have an ability to sort of translate that to, to the lives of the students. And so, um, I, I don't know, my strength may be a, a way of kind of building my courses so they start they have logical stepping stones that students seem to be able to hang on to as they move through the through the course. Um, humor is probably a part of that too, um, but again, it's a studio course. I think it happens. It's it's an easier situation for studio artists, oftentimes because you've got your students for two plus hours. Um, the first part of that is demonstration. Um, lecture, all those sort of informational things. But the last part is always them working in the studio. You're able to work alongside them, sort of be amongst them, and so you kind of, you're able to build up a little bit more maybe relationship, um, and maybe that, that the comfort level there, there is a little bit easier for them. You know, I've been thinking about this, especially as students have changed over the years. I, th I seem to be clear on it maybe 15 to 20 years ago on how students learn. Um, how I still think they learn, at least in my situation, is um, through sort of repetitive experience. And again, it's, it's pretty um, unique, I think, as, as a potter, as a clay artist, as artists in general. I think there's a certain skill level that has to sort of be... Um, fleshed out in order for them to begin to make aesthetic judgments and create um, works that have that sort of foundation. Um, and so uh, for me and for most potters it's repetitively working the steps. So you go first step, second step, and they, they, they layer these experiences atop one another in order to sort of have that foundation. Um, and so 
uh, when I create courses, I create them with that sort of, you know, logical stepping stone sort of approach to, to the learning of this process and then the, the learning of the uh, kind of the aesthetics of ceramics. I think I've probably spoken to this a little bit, but it's, again, it's that sort of um, reasonable layering of, of sort of the materials that I bring to the, to the class. Um, and, and I uh, design it in such a way as to sort of remember what's gone on before and, and look forward to what's ahead um, as, we, as we kind of move through the, the discipline of, of kind of this sort of clay process. I think over the course of time, too, that's been important to me. Because, I mean, certain things have worked and certain things haven't worked. And I go back to the drawing board, recreate a, a session. And so I've been at this long enough where it, it fe I can kind of feel how uh, the, the flow of the semester is going. Um, but again, you know, as we move from step to step, it seems to you know, have, have a, kind of a, an effect on the students that they can sort of grab hold of, of these things and move forward with it. Classes are kind of funny. I mean, there's a certain energy level, I think, to certain courses. I had some difficulties last semester, and I don't, you know, I'm still trying to sort of figure that out. It just seemed like there was not all that much energy to the course, and it didn't seem like I could infuse it with much for some reason. Um, and that was an unusual sort of situation for me. So I'm, you know, I'm, you know, thinking through my, am I getting old? Am I not relating as well? This semester seems like it's it's been much better, and I don't, you know, I haven't done anything differently, and so. There's a, a mystery to that. Um, but I do sort of take temperature at certain points in time. I mean, I've got my sort of things systematized. You know, the, court, the, the tests are at certain points in time. The demonstrations sort of follow this reasonable pattern. Um, we introduce new sort of areas of interest when I think things are starting to sort of maybe slow down a little bit. And so, you know, it's a lot of sort of wheel work, but there's also hand-building experiences. Um, we're also kind of talking about work. We're also getting into glaze demonstrations and that sort of thing. And so I think I, you know, as we kind of move along, that I try to introduce something new or a little bit different, a little bit exciting, do something that will sort of um, recreate a little bit of fervor. Um, sometimes, you know, it, it might be in me, you know, being a little foolish, you know, at a point in time where it might be called for. Oh, assessment is really different, I think, for studio situations. It's, there's no getting around that it's going to be a subjective evaluation on the part of the instructor um, for a great deal of the work. For me, it's 50% of the grade is based on the work that they turn at the end of the semester. Um, so I've given them markers, obviously, on this is the thing, this is what makes a strong form, um, these are the technical kinds of considerations, these are aesthetic sort of considerations but they have to kind of um, come up with those things on their own. So it's understood that that's going to be a, a part of it, and I let them know up front, it's on the syllabus, you, you know, can you live with this? Um, but there are also some very kind of black and white sort of assessment areas. They take three tests during the course of the semester on cognitive information, clay and glazes and firing and that sort of thing. And so they know where they stand in, in those areas. Um, I also assess whether they show up. I mean, they, they're graded on, on being here. They have to be here, see the demonstration, get to the, get to the working on those forms right away while it's still fresh in their memory banks. And so, so they're um, rewarded um, for being here and penalized for not. And then there's the little gray area of um, initiative and involvement. That's something that I like to reward, and I do notice it, uh, both in the work but also in, you know, people sort of being in the studio working. Their expectation is they will be, um, but I notice when they're putting over and above the, that expectation, and so I assess each of those areas. Um, what you're about to see is a demonstration in a beginning ceramics course. I think it was probably three to four weeks into the course, so they've just kind of gotten their, their hands dirty, so to speak, for, the, for a month or so. Um, they have learned in the previous session how to throw a bowl form, um, and in this session then they're going to learn how to turn it over, trim a foot rim into the base of that, of that bowl form. The students are a spectrum 
of students. I have students in each course that are majors, art majors, but probably no more than two or three art majors per class. And then I've just got people across the board from freshman year to senior year, nursing students, you know, education students, pre-med students. It's, it's kind of a, a broad range of, of people that are just interested in taking it. This course is heavily based on demonstration, um, and I've spoken to that a little bit uh, in that it, there's a skill level that needs to be developed. And so um, everything that they learn, they are viewing. And generally, I'll, I'll go through it twice um, in one session. Oftentimes, we'll do another review in another session. It depends on, on the kind of the difficulty of, of the form. Um, but trying to um, um, allow them to just sort of see and then model what's being done. Um, along with that, then, after they get to their work, I circulate and, and try to remind them of what they just saw because oftentimes it, it's fleeting. And so, no, you're holding the tool this way, or, you know, there's some really basic black and white sorts of simple things that, that uh, need to go on for them to succeed, and so I try to make sure I hit those, those points. second step of our two-step process for bowls. Um, we talked, you know, we talked and, and we're kind of showing how to throw the, the object. And then, um, today we're going to look at footprint. So the bowl is turned over. We're going to trim off this extra clay, leave this sort of platform, if you will, um, for the, for the uh, setting of the bowl. We're going to send one of these guys around just to sort of compare and contrast with what you're working with. So this is leather bar, and that's the state that we wanted this thing to get to. Um, and when you when you kind of pass it around, grab it by the body of the thing rather than the rim, so you don't break chunks off. Because I'll be using this one as my second demonstration. So, but you can kind of feel it. I mean, you can still get your thumbnail into it. It's still a little bit flexible. Um, it could be a little softer than this. Yours could be, but you really don't want it to be really sticky. Could even be a little bit firmer. But this is kind of at the firm side of things. So. Check that out. That's the leather hard state. We've been kind of working on strategies, and you know, some of you may have you know, succeeded in getting into leather hard, some of you may have failed, and they dried up completely, um, but it, it takes a little while to get the timing down on this. Okay, so in order to trim this off successfully, we've got to make we've got to kind of gauge this thing a little bit. I mean, we have to kind of figure out where we're, where we're going to be trimming, where we're not going to be trimming. So the first thing we want to do is decide where we begin. Take a thumb, finger, um, and you're running your hand down the inside, outside of the bowl, and where it begins to kind of spread out on you, okay? It's, you can tell it's getting thicker. You want to mark that. So in this case, these walls are pretty even and uniform to about right here, and then it begins to thicken up. So I'm just going to take a thumbnail or a mark or whatever. And, and make a make a line there, so I know I can start trimming at this point. Not much down below it. Okay. Second thing we want to do is sort of make a decision on where this foot rim is going to sit, how wide it should be, and that sort of corresponds to what's happening on the inside of the piece. Okay, if you have a very narrow platform, if it's coming down to a real kind of a V-like form inside, it's more likely you're going to have a smaller foot rim. If you have a wide base bowl flatter at the base and then rounding out, you're going to have a correspondingly larger foot rim. So it, it fits the shape. And later on, I mean, these bowls, we were going with sort of this half circle thing just to sort of develop that skill. But later on, as you, as you spread out and, and kind of work on different forms, you're going to find that you're going to be making certain bowls purposefully maybe wider at the base, and those would be more utilitarian possibly because they're going to be more stable. Okay? So in that case, wider foot rim. 
Uh, more elegant form would be something that's really narrow at the base and then kind of flares out. And in that case, you'd have you know, a narrow fulcrum that sort of fit the form. Now, as so I look at it, this guy, um, even though it's rounded, there is a place where I would say the, the, the wall kind of begins to um, become a floor area. Okay? So this is the floor of the pot, and then it starts to sweep up into the, into the body of this thing. And so about this wide, where my two fingers are, it's probably where I want to place that footprint. Right where that floor area, floorish area, sort of begins to sweep up into the wall. So I'm looking at about, you know, three plus inches. So what I'm going to do is, in order to sort of, uh, you know, kind of keep some continuity here, I'm going to make a little mark there. So it's probably going to be about that wide on the base as well. So I've got my mark there, there. And I know that this is the clay, and I have a visual indicator that tells me trimming from this point to this point. Not going to get much narrower than this, not going to go much further down than that. Then, we need to make a, a guess on how thick this is at the base. So a hand on the inside, a hand on the outside. You see it, it's a little difficult to gauge, but you can kind of get a feel for this. Is it like a quarter of an inch thick? Is it half an inch thick? Two quarters of an inch? And as I'm feeling this, it's probably half an inch plus. I mean, it feels like it's maybe about that thick. So that's something I want to keep in mind when I'm taking the clay off here. Okay. Um, lastly, before we sort of set this down, take a look at the interior of the bowl and just get that in your memory banks. Okay, what is happening with the shape of the inside? Because we're going to be duplicating that shape on the outside. So if you've got a little sort of a dimple on the inside at the bottom, you want to make sure you realize that so that when you're trimming that, you're not going to go down too deep. Or it doesn't go flat on the bottom and round up in the walls, you're going to kind of correspondingly make a flat floor before it rounds up in the walls. You have a wave in there somewhere that you'd want to know about before you trim. Sort of take that into consideration. Okay, so that's kind of preparing it for the trimming. Then we need to center this, recenter this on the wheel. Um, and there are a few ways of going about it. Now, we got a few of these wheels that don't have bats on them. They have these concentric circles. And they're kind of nice because you can just sort of take, take that, you know, place it within a concentric circle, even it off a little bit, and you can get pretty close to center and then just sort of fine tune it. When you're using bats like this, not quite as easy, easily done. I mean, one thing that you could do um, just to sort of ballpark it would be to make, you know, a few little. I don't want to get this real wet, but so that actually will kind of give you an idea of you know how close you are to being centered. But you're not centered yet because oftentimes the outside, the, the top of this this pot has gotten a little wonky on you. I think you've probably seen that. Okay. So um, you're not going to trust this. You really need to center the, the the upper section where you're going to be doing the trimming of this thing. But that gets you at least sort of close. Okay. So two ways of going about getting this on center. There's the um, quicker but more difficult way. It takes a little while to learn this. And there is the longer but probably more stable way of doing this. So the quicker, more difficult way is uh, with your hands. And you're going to kind of brace your arms on your legs. You're going to surround this with your hands, but you're not really touching it all that much with the exception of your thumbs here. And so as the clay comes around, as the pole comes around, Thumbs are up kind of toward the top. It's going to sort of scooch it a little bit. And you sort of develop a feel for this, but it kind of pops it onto, onto center. Okay? And again, we can kind of look at this thing from the top and see that it's no longer sort of wiggling. You know, you're kind of looking at this you know, circular motion that's pretty easy. Right. That's going to take a little while. Make sure that you get your hands surrounding this thing. Uh, make sure you're not booking the clay too fast because it pops and your, your thing goes flying unless you have your, your uh, hands kind of ready to catch it. So, um, But that may take a little bit of time. There's another method that you could try. I've never been able to kind of get this, but there are potters that just stick a bowl down, they go pop, 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 tap it right in the center and it just sort of magically happens. Oh, wow. You've been maybe lucky to try it. All right, second method takes a little bit longer, but it's, it's pretty sure. I'm just going to throw this off center a little bit. Um, 
And what you're going to be doing is kind of creating, you're going to be making marks on this piece that show you how, where it's furthest out from center. So you take a needle tool, you're not going to be running up to it really fast, you kind of sneak up on it and just barely, and you're starting near the top, just barely let it sort of touch that clay and it's going to create a line. So the line indicates furthest out from center. You bring it around so you're staring straight at the line, and then you're just going to push directly away from it. And then you're going to go again. So just slightly below, I'll do it again. And again, it's kind of grazing the clay there. The line is now getting a little bit longer, and that means you're getting closer. So. Again, another little push, and then slightly blow again. See, I've been fairly conservative on the pushes here, so I'll go one more time. I'm going to guess that I'm getting pretty close now. Okay, so that's pretty good. I mean, once you have a line that's pretty even all the way around, it's exhibiting that it's, it's centered. So, I mean, this may take a little while. You might be hitting it, you know, on one side for a while, and then you push too far, and then all of a sudden you notice the line has jumped over to the other side. So you have, you have to kind of work your way into center, okay? If perchance you have done four, you know, eight, ten lines on this thing, and you still haven't gotten it centered, and you've run the lines all the way down to the, you know, toward the, the uh, base here, you really need to kind of start over. but you have to sort of erase these guys first, okay? The other thing I should say is, I, I mentioned it, but you need to start at the top, work your way down. So if you're random kind of in your line making, pretty hard to tell after the 10th, 12th line which one was the last one you laid down. So start at the top, work your way down. If it doesn't happen for you the first time around, hold this thing, sort of erase those lines, and then start again. But we're looking for a line that pretty much happens all the way around, equal distance. And then we know it's on the center. And it's really important, I mean, you've got to get these things centered, um, otherwise this foot rim is going to be off to the side of the pot, you're going to have a real uneven, and one side of the wall is going to be quite thin, one side is going to be quite thick, and so Centering is a big deal for the trimming of this stuff. All right, then, we need to Attach this to the wheel head. And I like to use what I call clay. C L A Y clay. And I don't think I line L I N E, just in case you're writing. I'll just carry it if you are. Okay, no. um, So what we're going to do is we're going to make coils out of clay. C O I L, a coil. And then multiple would be coils with a tassel. So well, we're going to do this, okay? Hand, hand, and then one hand. The hand is forward, backward, forward, backward. She's going to mock But what you're going to do is this. So that's not going to do anything. You need to have, see, one hand going forward while the other one's going backward. With pressure between the two and a coil is made. Okay. So we need four of those guys. So when you're attaching this thing, you need to hold the piece down firmly to the wheel head. If you don't, and you just shove this down, it's going to shove it off center again. You'll have to start all over again. So hold this thing down. Press the clay around the piece. And we're stuck down. One of the reasons that I, when we were throwing the bowls, I said you really want the, the top two, three inches to be as thin as you want it to be when it's finished is, is because of this, because of the way you're attaching it. You're not going to be able to trim it all the way down to the base, and so we want this thin enough where we don't have to, to deal with that. Okay, new tools for the day. We're going to do some trimming tools here. So <coughs> holding it like this, you've got, you know, the, the handle and a little bit of a brace on the, on the forefinger here. Um, and then, generally, with my left hand, I'm just letting it kind of slide with the piece. So I'm kind of engaged with both hands here, and I've got um, this thumb bracing the, the, uh, the tool. 
And you're going to have to find the angle that, that works. I mean, obviously this is not working out real well, okay? So we're going to have to kind of figure out, and once you start seeing this stuff sort of trim away from the piece, you know you're in, in uh, the right place. We don't want to start with the tool on its side like this. Even though it's trimming some clay away, it tends to start riding with the pot, and all of a sudden you get this really wavy surface. We want to be cutting through that clay. So we start off with the smallest loop, and you're going to have to find an angle, get it out there a little bit. It's, you know, this is more, much more comfortable. You're going to have to find a way to turn, turn this thing, and then begin trimming this clay away. And we've got our two marks. Okay, I know I can go as far as this, and I'm already kind of into where I want to go with the foot. I erased it when I was fiddling around here. But I'd say right about there, I'm going to establish that, that uh, circle for the foot rim. And then all of this stuff is extra clay. And as I said before, we're trying to mimic what happened on the inside. We're going to establish, uh, and there are a lot of different shaped bowls, and there are bowls that don't have a defined foot room where it just kind of it just runs up and, and ends. But we want to, at this point, kind of learn how to work with, with these defined platforms, if you will, footprints. And so I'm going to establish that just by kind of cutting down a little bit more. Okay. And this is fairly clumsy. I mean, visually it kind of comes up, backs in. I know that the interior of the bowl has this rounded thing, and so I'm going to go a step or two further by just taking away this extra clay to mimic the form on the inside of the piece. So most of the clay is taken away with this smallest little, little curved thing. You can then sort of turn this over. And this is kind of, this is a bit of a fine tuning. Okay. Finally, after you've done all the taking away of the clay to finish this off, then you can turn it on its side and use the side of the tool to shave this surface a bit. Okay. So, that gets rid of the extra clay on the outside. It establishes the foot rim. Um, and you can do some things then visually with this foot rim. One of the simplest things is just to use the curve of the, of the, uh, of the tool here. But it could be straight up and down. It could splay out a little bit. Um, all I'm going to do is use the curve of the tool to define this a little bit. And that will that'll do me for, for the exterior. Okay? Next. We need to take out the clay from the interior now. And so um, we're going to change tools. This is a smaller trimming tool. You'll find both of them over in our little, little cabinet there. Um, smallest end first. This, the, there's kind of a wider end, smaller end. We're going to go with the smaller end. And I, again, with my left hand, I'm just letting this kind of ride like this. And I'm going to place this tool right on my thumb. Instead of going at it like this, which can, you, if, with, if you're not careful, you can kind of jerk into the, into the rim and take part of it out. So I'm using my thumb as a little bit of a barrier there. I'm going to take the very end of this thing and just begin to carve down into it. Okay, so I think I can go one more time. By the way, um, you know, when you're tripping the interior, you're going to get all these little kind of scraps of clay that are in there, and you probably notice you get it. And every once in a while, you're going to have to blow that stuff out of there, okay? If you are a gum chewer, or <laughs> tobacco, which I think is a disgusting habit we need to talk about, <laughs> um, you're going to have to find a way to tuck that away somewhere, okay? Go to the underneath it. Tongue, possibly, or back on a back tube, something like that. You can't get it in the airflow because you're blowing with great velocity, <laughs> like that. And it, it closed a little encasement, a little, and it, it can shoot out of that thing. High velocity. Gum is a kind of a, a, a rubbery substance, bounces off. It can take your eye out. <laughs> you, know, you wear glasses, that's pretty good. But it can also take uh, your neighbor's eye out. And that's the, like a lawsuit. <laughs> 
<laughs> You'll be paying for that off for the rest of your life. So we want to be careful. So I'm going to just kind of clean up the edge of this a little bit. And then you can turn the tool on its side and just shave this thing a bit. And you can even turn it at an angle if you need to to get into the corners. But that kind of cleans things up at the, at the base. Some people, I'm not one of them, but some people burnish the entire thing. And I've never been sure as to why, because once you put glaze on it, you can't tell whether it's been burnished or not. But I still like to do that. And <laughs> soft and smooth. That's probably what, just a tactile thing. That's probably what was important. Okay. In fact, you know, if I were to describe this, I would say this is as smooth as the baby's behind. Right here. Okay, this, this will be interesting. Does anyone have access to a baby? Does <laughs> your sister have a baby or you work in, you know, you nanny or anything like that? Oh, we can get one from the, from the, over the seminary. They have the child resource center thing with us. Anyway, I think what we're going to do, this will be really good, is we're going to get a little baby, okay? I know some of you have access. You can get it. And this is the fun game. So we just blindfold people, okay? And then we hold a bowl freshly trimmed up to one cheek, rub it around a little baby like this, up to this. And I'm telling you, you cannot tell the difference. It's amazing. They're both kind of cold and clammy like this. Okay. So we're going to send this around, and, and, and it's kind of a before and after thing. You, you, you uh, kind of felt the, the pot that was sent around earlier, but this is a trimmed form now. And we're going to do it one more time. Can you do any carving to the bowl? Yeah, yeah, and you could do some decorative stuff on the on the exterior, and and you know, kind of play with the foot rails. I mean, you can do a number of things. That's pretty much kind of a simple process. But um, if you want, you could do a series of lines on the outside or you know, whatever you would like to. Same thing with the bowl rim itself. It could be a little bit more defined by uh, when your hands kind of carved into it, a studio. And I was working on my own. Okay, working on my own work. And when I do that, oftentimes I'll get into what I call the zone. Okay, this is the creative zone. Many of you are never going to find yourself in that zone. It's only for special people like myself and just a few of us. Now, what happens in the creative zone is almost a hypnotic state, really. I start to concentrate, you know, all my powers are concentrated on this work of art that I'm engaged with. And, uh, and, and everything else slides away. Okay, I can't hear things, I can't, I can see only one thing, and um, it, it's just really an amazing, powerful place to be, okay? This is without any help from chemicals. <laughs> now, for some reason, I did hear something that one day. Oh, by the way, if you see me in the zone, there are some visual, um, you'll be able to notice because what, you know, I'll, I'll be doing this thing, my eyes get kind of crossed, okay? So when I look at you and they're kind of crossed, that means that, you know, and I also drool. <laughs> so if I'm cross-eyed and drooling, he's in the zone, don't bother. So anyway, one day I hear, it's a really high screechy sort of sound. It's coming from that direction. Well, I'm in the zone and I just kind of push it out. But a little bit later, okay? It's this high piercing sound. And it finally sort of cuts through my zone dome. And I'm, I look into that room, and there's these two big guys, football player kind of guys. Okay? Have you ever noticed how big guys, when they get really mad, their voices raise about seven octaves, and they, they're really high all of a sudden? So they're both holding a bowl. Okay? And it turns out they're saying, It's my bowl. Oh, it's my bowl. And they're back and forth, tugging on a bowl like this. And it's a bowl that's been missed, so they're not breaking. Okay? That's before I had everybody sign their pieces. So inevitably, there would be, you know, 100 bowls that had been bisked, got to, kind of at stake, and there's always three or four really nice ones. Generally, you know, they're the ones that I demonstrated, but they, <laughs> they thought it was theirs. They hadn't signed it, and they're fighting over this thing, okay? So, I'm get up and wipe my mouth off. 
<laughs> go in there. I said, give me that bowl. Take the bowl. I cut this bowl in half, give you each a half a bowl. And then one of the guys said, no, no, don't do that. Give it to him. <laughs> so that's how I knew who belonged to the bowl. <laughs> demonstration you can find yours and get to it. So what are you seeing with this group? Well, I'm seeing I think um, they seem to be uh, of where my standard classes are. I'm not sure why that is. I, mean, I could blame it on my teaching I suppose but I have a feeling that I think there's sort of a, an energy that happens in, the, in a group and when some people are sort of forging ahead it, it helps draw others along the way. And I think maybe I've got some good advanced students too that are in here quite a bit, and so there's, there's some um, modeling going on where they're they're seeing plots being made on a kind of a, a higher level, and they're going, I could, you know, maybe I could do this, do that, and so it sort of uh, opens the, the gates a little bit for, for them to try some things maybe they wouldn't even have thought of. rounded form and so I'm going to start in the center with my left hand it's going to start sliding across my outside hand is going to push in at the very bottom they squeeze the clay they kind of engage and then they bring the clay up and out which is what the clay wants to do anyway so it's going to feel a lot more natural than the cylinder did so the left hand is swinging across right hand is pushing in grabbing some of that clay and then I just bring it up out expand this that you, you throw down, the, what hit the canvas last faces up toward you, okay. and then what hit the canvas last goes right down on top of you, so you know your leg. Okay? okay? So that essentially these two sides come together like this. So I'm throwing one down, that's, that's the side that was on canvas last, and I'm throwing the other side down that was on canvas last on top of it, and then I'll turn it over. So okay. And you can do that 20 times. That kind of creates this layering system where it's two layers, four layers, eight, six, eight. Oh. And, and pretty much, you know, after, after you do it 15, 20 times, there are no longer any layers. You got this kind of oh, even man. homogenous lump of clay. All the air pockets are driven out. 
Um, this is a good way to go, especially if you're mixing softer and harder clay together, that sort of thing. But until you're really good at it, it does add more air than it and gets rid of. It, so, yeah. A little bit of an edge right here. Um, so get it going around again. A little bit faster. Yeah. Okay, so now just take the side of the tool. You got it? Yeah. You start here and I'd sort of raise it up a little bit. And just shave that a little bit more. Just kind of roll back and forth between the two. Okay, now close it off. Yeah, that's good. I think I can get much of a little further because I think I made it pretty pretty good. That, you know, that's all right. Even if you go down and eat more inch, you've done enough to. Well, first of all, I think um, we have to recognize that art in and of itself is, is purely a, um, a selfish act. And, and so, you know, to make it legitimate as, you know, a Christian, I tend to have my students, like, write, God loves you, Jesus loves you on the bottom of their pots. Or, you know, some of the theology students do Yahweh, but that's not as broad you know, an understanding as some people would have. And so I figure that way, evangelistically, you know, it's out there. The pots that they're making are out there. Um, or they could do kind of for their own theological sort of internal discourse, they could do Bible verses maybe. And that's sort of all tongue-in-cheek here, of course. Um, I, we talk a little bit about um, the theology of being makers and being makers in God's image. And so that's, you know, that sort of uh, discourse goes on. Um, I, I talk about that, and but primarily I talk to them about um, enjoying and experiencing that part of God's life within them. They've been created by a creative God. They've been recreated through Jesus by a creative God. Um, and all of this, um, whatever we do in our lives, whether it's physics, whether it's art, whether it's, you know, teaching, um, whether it's nursing, uh, there is a creative act and in, in, in problem solving and finding better ways to do things. And in art, it's the same thing. And so for my students, maybe 90 plus percent of them are not art majors. They're not going to do this for the rest of their lives. Um, but they're going to have this experience of being um, kind of primal creators, if you will. I mean, clay is pretty much, you know, very, very primal in, its, in, its, in the medium. And so... Um, I invite them to experience that, to give thanks, to enjoy it, um, and to be the people that they were made to be. Um, so that's kind of it. It's more an experiential thing. Um, uh, and uh, my facetious sort of beginning was to speak to uh, that thought in some cases where people do feel like art has to be, it has to be a ministry of some sort or whatever you do it has to be a direct ministry and how can I tweak this so it, it'll be legitimate in my mind and I say, you know, that's, that's not the deal. You know, it's all God's uh, world that we experience and, and um, where do we put our minds and, and our, our uh, kind of creative capacities. That's been a funny one. I, I think as I've looked at that, I've sort of divided things out. Um, and it would be nice to be balanced, but they aren't. You know, obvious, I mean, I, to me it's obvious. Teaching um, has, has always been sort of the, the mainstay. Um, and and the, um, my professional kind of aspect of, of being an artist ends up coming in second. As much as I'd like to say, oh, that's yeah, equal balance. I'm an artist. I'm a teacher. Um, that's not the... the the truth in, in terms of time commitment. Um, and I, um, service ends up third. And I think everyone's going to have kind of a different sort of shuffle on this thing, but, but for me that's realistically what happens. Um, I'm a teacher, I'm an artist, and then the service part is, is kind of, you know, as opportunities arise. I recognize one thing about myself. Some people, Dale Johnson, our painter, is, is this type of person. They can have nine irons going in the fire. They can do all sorts of things and, and be involved in, in a great deal of, of things. 
I have tried to kind of hone my life down because I don't have that capacity, you know, mentally or emotionally. Um, and so, and so I'm simplifying and, um, and that's just sort of my balance is, is an imbalance. Because it's sort of in the blood, I guess. I mean, I, I still enjoy it. I still believe in um, Bethel's mission. I still believe in the mission of this art department. I still feel like I fit it. Um, and there's something um, still that invigorates me when, when I see lights turn on with, with students, when, I, um, when they have that opportunity to be these makers. Maybe it's the only time in their life, or maybe they'll continue and pursue it. Um, but it's a kind of a once in a lifetime experience um, for many and that opens doors I mean I, I hope and feel that it opens doors to a kind of another aspect to their life that's broadened and, and um, both by way of faith and by way of just you know life so I, I it just I, I still uh, enjoy it I guess I'd give um, to a teacher starting their first year is um, oh man it's not always going to be this way you know <laughs> it's just tough they're putting together their courses maybe for the first time um, they're just trying to balance a lot and and so I just want to let them know it gets better um, for a fifth year teacher if they've got tenure I'd say settle down um, they've gone through the wars, and you know, I mean, the likelihood is that maybe kids are there in their lives and all that sort of thing, and and they may need to find some balance and recognize that that they can't be burning the candle all the time. Um, and for a fifteenth year, I thought about this, and I wasn't coming up with with anything. I don't think I um, I feel like it's just. Uh, kind of um, enjoy the professional aspect of, of your life. I mean, I think by then your craft of teaching has probably been tweaked and, and maneuvered and, you, and you've improved that. Um, and, and at this point in time, whatever, if you're writing, if you're researching, if you're, if you're making, um, there may be opportunity there to put more emphasis on that and to experience it in, in a broader, deeper way. I continue to grow as a teacher by continuing to grow as an artist. And so it's it's in, in my studio, the work that I'm doing, you know, as I'm looking forward to shows or whatever it is, um, just the making aspect sort of keeps me charged up. And so, you know, that translates pretty directly into, into the things that I'm teaching and, and uh, you know, keeps me, keeps me excited. And, and that's particularly true, not, maybe it's not so true at the beginning level, but it's particularly true as I move um, and become more mentor, uh, more of a mentor for the advanced students, um, because the work that I'm doing there is a little bit more. Probably um, they're able to assimilate that a little bit more and to kind of recognize it. And so, I think that's that's how it happens with me, at least. I hope my legacy is um, one that. Um, open doors for, for people. Um, again, in just whether it's once in a lifetime or whether it's a, a lifetime of, of artistic experience um, in this particular medium, that it's something that, you know, w was a, a gift given that, that they could, you know, assimilate and enjoy and, and have as a part of their lives. Another thing, I, um, I'm trying to remember back when, when Dan Taylor was retiring um, they were doing a little spoof on his thing, and, and uh, I think Joey Horseman was the one who said, you know, Taylor hasn't been around here for a long time. And, you know, if, if I'm recognized, you know, if I can slide out gracefully, and <laughs> that'll be fine by me, too.